Elizabeth. Hello, everyone. Um, I am Heather Addison, the chair of the UNLV Department of Film. And this is Raising Our Voices, Combating Sexual Harassment in the Film and Television Industry. <laughs> I'm really pleased to welcome all of you here today. Um, hopefully this will be a safe and productive space for sharing stories of sexual harassment in the film and television industry and considering how we can move forward. So I'm gonna begin by introducing each of our esteemed panelists. Alphabetically, I'm gonna have Susan Anton. Susan? Hello, everybody. Susan Anton has been recognized as a multi-talented international star for more than 35 years in television, film, theater, and concert venues. She was nominated for a Golden Globe in her first film outing, Golden Girl, and was soon thereafter signed by NBC to star in her own variety show, Presenting Susan Anton. ABC later signed her to a development deal where she starred in the hourly drama Cliffhangers. She's appeared in hundreds of film and television projects over the years, and that includes theatrical productions as well, Broadway and Off-Broadway. Um, Susan and her husband, director Jeff Lester, have called Las Vegas home for more than 20 years. In 1997, they opened their own production company, Big Picture Studios, under their banner. Under their banner, Susan executive produced the award-winning the Last Real Cowboys, starring Oscar winner Billy Bob Thornton, and also executive produced the documentary Speed of Life with Amy Purdy, the inspirational Sochi bronze medalist who was also runner-up in Dancing with the Stars. Susan is currently a minority partner and, cele and celebrity brand ambassador in a new California-based beverage company, Spa Girl Cocktails. Welcome, Ms. Anton. Thank you. And I'm going to say, I've noticed, I'm a, I'm a PhD and a film scholar. I've noticed over the years that when people refer to women, um, we often use their first names rather than their last names. Um, so, and it's a mark of respect. Like when I'm writing an article, I use the last name of a scholar and never the first name because I don't want to be too familiar. But I would like to, with the panelists permission today, be able to use first names, but Absolutely. acknowledging that it's in a very respectful as way. As long as you say, Miss Susan Anton. <laughs> um, <laughs> thank you very much. So I just wanted to note that, that I may be using the panelists' first names, but it is certainly with all respect. Um, our next panelist is Alexis Krasilovsky. Could you please wave? Welcome. Mm -hmm. After studying film history at Yale University, Alexis, Kra Alexis Krasilovsky embarked on a career as an independent filmmaker and holographer. She lay, and that's a very interesting history. She later received an MFA in film and video from, the, from Cal Arts, the California Institute of the Arts. As head of her own production company, Raphael Film LLC, she has written, directed, and produced numerous documentaries, video poems, and art films, including End of the World, Exile, What Memphis Needs, and Blood. Her global documentary feature, Women Behind the Camera, and we'll shortly be seeing a, a brief clip from that, and the shorter version, Shooting Women, won five Best Documentary Awards, as well as a Tribute Award, quote, for achievement in independent cinema from the San Francisco Women's Film Festival, and a Lifetime Achievement Award from the Dan Gdansk Doc Film Festival. Most recently, she has written the book Great Adaptations, Screenwriting and Global Storytelling and a novel entitled Sex and the Cyborg Goddess under a pseudonym, Alexis Raphael. And both of those books are here and available if you're interested in them at the end of the session. Um, the novel tax tackles sexual liberation and sexual assault on a college campus and sexual harassment in the film industry, so very germane to what we're discuss discussing today. Uh, Alexis is professor in the Department of Cinema and Television Arts at California State University, Northridge, where she's taught film production, screenwriting, and media theory and criticism. Welcome. Thank Next. Thank, thank you. It's really an honor to be here. Up. Welcome, welcome. Next, we have Anne McGinley. Anne, could you wave? Thank you. Um, Anne C. McGinley is the William S. Boyd Professor of Law at the Boyd School of Law at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, where she has taught employment law, employment discrimination, torts law, disability law, and seminars on employment and gender since 1999. Wow. Professor McGinley is the co-director of the Workplace Law Program and a member of the Health Law Program at Boyd School of Law. She is an internationally recognized scholar in the areas of employment, disability, and torts law, and a leader in multidimensional masculinities theory, an emerging discipline that applies masculinities theory from social sciences to legal interpretation. She has published more than 50, oh my 
God. I, I was so impressed when I first read this number. Law Review articles and book chapters. She is the author of Masculinity at Work, Employment Discrimination Through a Different Lens. This book uses masculinity's theory to analyze Title VII employment discrimination cases and to propose new applications of the law. McGinley is the editor of Masculinities and the Law, a multi-dimensional multi approach with Frank Rudy Cooper and the author of Disability Law, Cases, Materials, Problems, Sixth Edition, and Disability Law, Statutory Appendix, Federal Statutes and Regulations, Fifth Edition. So our esteemed panelists, we welcome you here today. Thank you. And next we have J.J. Snyder. Could you please wave? Yes. Sitting next to me. Um, with a background as a television host and actress, J.J. Uh, Snyder has interviewed many of Hollywood's biggest stars, including Tom Cruise, Kate Blanchett, and Morgan Freeman. Working as a correspondent for ABC's On the Red Carpet, she covered major movie premieres, celebrity chefs, and award shows. In 2016, she was thrilled to join the Las Vegas Morning Blend on ABC Channel 13. A live performer in her own right, J.J. has gone from equity theater to jumping out of boxes as a magician's assistant. <laughs> After graduating from USC, which in the academic world can actually mean University of South Carolina or University of oh, Southern California, Carolina. but I know here it's U University of Southern California. JJ hustled to get in the actors' union working as an extra till she booked her first role in the film Coyote Ugly. She's gone on to play many notable characters in films and on hit TV shows such as NCIS LA, Two Broke Girls, Family Guy, Castle, Grey's Anatomy, Glee, and Two and a Half Men. Welcome, JJ. Yay. We were going to have two Thomases on this panel. Samantha Thomas here with us today. So if you could wave. <laughs> Samantha Thomas is an Emmy Award winning journalist and talk show host. She is the creator and executive producer of Small Talk with Samantha, a, a lifestyle talk show airing monthly on Vegas PBS Channel 110. She received her degree in journalism from Lincoln University of Missouri and has worked as a TV news producer in markets across the United States, including Missouri, CBS, Las Vegas, Fox, and CBS, and her hometown of Chicago, CBS and WGN. Samantha hopes her talk show will not only touch her demographic of women, but others with a message of hope. She lives by the motto, if you can dream it, you can achieve it. Welcome. Yay. <laughs> And finally, we have Deborah Waite. Deborah, if you could. Hello. Um, we welcome you here today. Deborah has over a decade of experience in the film and television industries. A licensed cosmetologist, Deborah began her career on the set of Scare Tactics, assisting Jim Saka uncredited. A strong and supportive mentor, Jim threw Deborah into many projects, thus giving her a diverse body of experience very quickly. On her own, Deborah started working at a small studio and within a year became the department head at that broadcast studio in Las Vegas. Deborah was also heading up hair and makeup crews for runway shows, live events, and print work. As her career evolved, Deborah's work um, came. Deborah, as her career evolved, Deborah came to work alongside some of her most respective colleagues, like Eve Pearl, Melissa Street, and Alex Noble. Deborah has won a few local awards, and films she's worked on have gotten recognized on the festival circuit. She's rapidly risen through the ranks in her community through hard work and dedication to her craft. Currently, Deborah is working on several projects, and when not on set, she's either in the salon or instructing in a classroom. Welcome, Deborah. Yay. Um, I'm just, I have a little bit of contextual information to kind of set the stage for dis today's discussion. Then we're gonna go to a short clip of Alexis's film, and then we'll get into questions for the panelists. And finally, as time allows, we'll be doing Q&A. I know the session is scheduled to go from 12 to 2 p.m., but we're actually gonna end at 1.30 so that you have time for a break to get some food before the two o'clock session, um, which is the Stephanie Rothman film, followed by Q&A, and that's gonna be a really interesting session. So a pervasive problem, I don't know if you can even read that, um, but they are heavy and serious words, a pervasive problem, statistics on sexual harassment in the film and television industry. So I wanted to give this discussion kind of a grounding in some statistics, although it's hard to know exactly, of course, how often this occurs, because much of it goes unreported. Um, since the emergence of the Me Too movement in October of 2017, 
there have been some attempts to quantify what the contemporary situation is. Um, and so this actually comes out of a project from USA Today, which is not known for its hard news necessarily. But they reached out and really did a comprehensive survey through some of the, the organizations listed here, trying to speak to women in the industry. So this represents um, data from 843 women currently working in the film and TV industry, 94% of whom reported um, one or more incidents of sexual misconduct in their careers. And I don't know if you can... Can you, can, you read, um, can you read that at all? Some of the percentages for different types of behavior? I'm just gonna make mine a little bit bigger. I'm like the classic absent-minded blind professor, so I have to look closely here. Um, but just to give you some examples, unwelcome sexual comments, jokes, or gestures about you, and this is you know the woman who is responding, 87%. Witnessing others experiencing unwanted forms of sexual comments, 75%. Being touched in a sexual way, 69%. Witnessing others advance professionally from sexual relationships with employers or managers, 65%. Proposition for a sexual act or relationship, 64%. Being shown sexual pictures without consent, 39%. Someone flashing or exposing themselves to you, 29%, being forced to do a sexual act, 21%, ordered unexpectedly to appear naked for auditions, 10% of the women surveyed. So those are obviously very worrisome numbers, and I wanted to kind of you know, set the foundation, set the parameters of our discussion in, in relation to, some of, to, the, to a sense that this is a really pervasive problem. And if we could go to the next slide, please. And I will defer to Anne for all legal questions, but I did want to set the stage a bit um, with a definition or an understanding, a shared understanding of what sexual harassment is from a legal standpoint. Um, it is a form of unlawful sex discrimination. So the law defines sexual harassment as unwelcome, verbal, visual, nonverbal, or physical conduct of a sexual nature or based on someone's sex that is severe or pervasive and affects working conditions or creates a hostile work environment. So a single incident may constitute harassment. And the federal law prohibiting sexual harassment in the workplace comes from Title VII, and you'll remember I mentioned Title VII in um, Ms. McGinley's or Anne's biography, because that's where her area of expertise lies, of the 1964 Civil Rights Act. So it's often just called Title VII. And this applies to most private and public employers, labor organizations, employment agencies, and joint employer union apprenticeship programs with 15 or more employees. So it should apply to us in virtually any situation in which we're working in the film or television industry. We should all be, we are protected by Title VII, but sometimes getting that protection can be a difficult proposition. And can we go now to the final slide? So I think a fundamental question today is, how does the workplace culture in the film and television industry lead to incidents of sexual harassment and discrimination? And how can that culture be changed? So now we'd like to show a brief clip from Alexis Kraslovsky's 2007 award-winning film, Women Behind the Camera. Um, it's actually available on Amazon Prime if you have a chance to check it out. But we'll just show one brief clip um, to give us a sense of a woman in the industry and the efforts that she was making, at least as of 2007, to try and address some of these issues. So to Alexis, um, your film, Women Behind the Camera, was released more than a decade ago, and we may at some point see a short clip. The sexual harassment of women in the industry is still rampant enough <laughs> that it has sparked a national and international movement. Does that dishearten you or make you feel that change is finally on the horizon? Well, I, I think it's really wonderful that we're here today finally speaking out. I mean, the reason we're here today is to celebrate that by banding together, we will no longer have to fear being blacklisted like Kristen Glover felt when was she was she? groped by Arnold Schwarzenegger oh. <laughs> and, uh, and many, many others, I mean, thousands of others. Well, when we fight for our work to, uh, right to, uh, uh, to work without being harassed, I mean, harassment is 
is really a terrible form of discrimination. It can destroy our feelings of self-worth and it can take away the joys of, of, of working behind the camera creatively and, or in front of the camera creatively. Uh, and it can take away our livelihood, uh, our chances of livelihood. It can cause many years of post-traumatic stress disorder. And the fact that women are speaking out everywhere, not only in Las Vegas today, but everywhere, fighting and marching and teaching, uh, writing articles, <laughs> uh, uh, whatever it takes to uh, ensure a, a positive and lasting change in the industry. That's why we're here today. So as women, what are the challenges that you faced in the film and television industry? Have you or your close colleagues experienced sexual harassment and or discrimination? And would you be willing to share some of that with us today? So I'm gonna go first to you, JJ. Thank you. Um, wow, this is a big answer. I've experienced sexual discrimination, harassment rather, uh, in the entertainment industry uh, dozens of times. Um, I actually was looking for a pen because I was going to start just making a list of, oh yeah, and then that happened. Um, yes, throughout, at all levels actually too, which is surprising, everywhere from the theater group that I was a part of that was really exceptional. Um, we had a residency at a very well-known theater uh, in the Valley in Los Angeles, and the climate of the theater company was... Um, one that uh, the leader, a guy, he kind of did whatever he wanted and women were treated in ways that were really horrendous. And the whole concept was you just shut up or you leave. Um, for instance, one night we were all at a, a diner after a show and uh, one of my fellow actors took his, this is when phones like just came out. I mean, just came out. So I'd never seen this happen now. You've heard about it a lot, but one of the actors took his phone and took a picture up the waitress's skirt. And um, everyone, I mean, the guys just thought this was fantastic. They just thought this was the best thing. And I was so angry and so uncomfortable. Of course, wanting to fit in, and these people are my friends, but I spoke up and I was angry. And the head of the theater company just turned to me and said, um, JJ, this is what you do. This is what we do. If you don't like it, you can get the fuck out of here. And at that moment, I was so shut down. I was so shut down because I felt that what was happening was so wrong. And yet, I did not want to lose this whole group of people. You know, I mean, that's, that's the terrible thing is that a young actress in Hollywood, you're given the choice of you either take it or you leave. That has been the culture, so... Um, that's one incident of dozens. Yes, I um, have often been in leadership positions and I've blatantly had men look at the man standing next to me who was sometimes my subordinate, but when they realize that they have to talk to me, it's like, oh, 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 well, well you. And it's really a just you, not well, Samantha or Miss Thomas. And um, I've, I've had that and I've, I've even heard some of you all kind of agreeing. It's just like when they figure out that it is me that they need to talk to, it's kind of like, oh, okay, well, you even notice the voice will change. It's, it's yeah. kind of more like, a yeah, you know, mm -hmm. not taking me seriously because I'm a woman. And then I thought at one point, is it because I'm under a certain age when I was in my 20s? And it was just always, I couldn't, I couldn't help that I was being placed in leadership positions. It was just, I worked hard to get to where I was. And I just often felt like, well, what's wrong? Like, why aren't I being taken seriously? It, it, is it because, you know, do I need to do more? Do I need to, no, it was just because of my gender, you know, and I, I had to come to that realization. But what it made me do was just go more hard. You know, I, I <laughs> hey, that, that's how I feel. When, when, when one door closes, that means that's not the door for you. Go around the corner to the back, to the side, do what you gotta do. And if it's not working with a certain group of people, you know, just move on. Right. But sometimes I was stunted by wanting to move on because it was always, it's always somebody. It's always somebody. So I have, that's been one of my major things, especially working in TV news. Um, I just always sometimes felt like I needed to just prove myself even extra, like like harder, 
you know, because either it was just like the guys club, the movie Anchorman was so on point. Right. You know, it was right. it was hilarious, but you know, you all you had the Ron Burgundy and his crew at a lot of the stations. It it was the man's world. So working in TV news, that's the the area that I came from. I saw it a lot. You know, I I didn't know at first. I thought was it the color of my skin. I did. I thought that at first. Is it because I'm a brown girl? Is it because of that? But it, it wasn't just that. I watched a lot of women, you know, just, just basically, you just not taken seriously. So yes. I was thinking about this question a lot when you and Brett sent it to me. And my experience has been very different because when you're in the makeup trailer or the makeup room with me, um, and actresses know this, it's, the actors know this, it's, it's an intimate relationship. It's almost like a forced intimacy because I have to be touching you and 18 inches away from you. So there's a, there's a level of um, respect and, you know, because I have to physically, you know, touch you. And so having those relationships with actors and things like that, my personal experience, I haven't come across that directed at me, and I've, I've obviously been very fortunate because the statistics are scary. Yeah. And then um, as far as, as, far as um, the seeing, witnessing sexual harassment in others, I have, however, I had a really um, great mentor who was not shy about opening his mouth <laughs> when he saw stuff that was wrong. So I learned from that person that, you know, if I see something that I disagree with, I need to speak up. So in doing that, um, the incident uh, that I remember the most was I had an assistant with me on a film and we were working very closely together with a lot of people and it was a busy set and everything like that and there was a producer that was you know making unwanted advances her and uh, to her and she was very uncomfortable and she said something to me and she said something to him and then she had a reputation as a bitch and she yeah. they she wasn't talked to anymore and they were cold to her because you know she didn't want this guy hitting on her so um uh, it was it was hard getting through the rest of the movie because now there was like you know t tension and all this kind of thing and trying to stick up for her and she's you know she's really a nice person kind of thing and and you know it was it was a sad experience in that you know she got punished for saying something and so did I kind of but um, I don't regret saying anything <laughs> right. so um, but yeah it was it's really interesting the relationship that I have with people just because the makeup trailer is a you know a safer a, the safest place I think that should be where you can say anything to me and it'll never get repeated I'll always respect your personal space and so hopefully you know it'll continue to be that way and um, and as far as changing the inter, uh, the entertainment industry, I, I'm really proud of the Me Too movement, and I think it's and I think it's an amazing, amazing thing. And the the thing that inspired me the most was um, when I was watching the Golden Globes and watching Oprah's speech. Like I watched it over and over yeah. and over and over again. It was yeah. so inspiring. Was so <laughs> well, yeah, uh, you know, uh, it's a thrill to be here. Uh, hashtag Me Too thing. Uh, movement, not thing, movement, is powerful. And today also, you know, the March for Our Lives. I mean, these are exciting, exciting times that we are living in uh, where our voices will be heard, and uh, there's no denying it. And what I've, I've watched um, through the years. I started in the industry in the early 70s, and the evolution of women in our industry has been profound, and we've had a jump over a lot of hurdles, as all of the women here are acknowledging. Uh, when Samantha was saying, it's a man's world, all I could, all I could think of, it's a man's world, but it wouldn't be nothing without a woman or a girl, right? <laughs> a woman's point of view is vital. It's vital to tell the full story of who we are as people. Um, as, as far as uh, my personal journey, I have, too, been very blessed. I have not had to deal with um, lewd and um, you know, propositions and uh, conditions. 
Um, maybe that's because I was raised with my dad was uh, a police officer and a detective and and you know he kind of taught me to really be out there and take care of myself and I had three brothers and a strong mother so I had a foundation of I knew to speak up for myself not to say that I wouldn't sometimes not go along with the off-color joke because I desperately wanted to fit in I wanted to be the good girl I wanted to be liked um, you know, so there's layers and there's different levels of sexual harassment. And you can tell, you can feel it in your gut. And if you feel that something is not right, then it is imperative that you stand up and you speak up. And now you can because the, the unification of this movement that you are not alone and you won't be ousted, you know, because people have got your back. Because that was a dangerous thing. We all want to do what we love. We want to build these careers in whatever walk of life that is. And uh, now there is a, a backbone to that movement where if you find that you're being discriminated then uh, or propositioned or held back because you're not playing the game, there are avenues now. There, there are people that got your back. However, I do remember very clearly, and then I'll, um, we'll, we'll kind of get on, because God knows, you can tell I have a lot to say. Um, I remember working on the film Cannonball Run 2. Fabulous, Burt Reynolds was lovely. Great, you know, led the cast well, but the director was Hal Needham, lovely guy, but a real guy's guy. And so I just remember at one point, because every all of the men on the set, he would say, okay, now, Bert, I want you to go here, and uh, Dom, I want you to go there, and he would direct the men and use their name. And then all of the women, hey, honey, hey, honey, can you come over here? And I finally said, I'm sorry, are you talking to me? Because I have a name. And until you call me by my name, there is no action. <laughs> you know, there is no, and now, Honey, get in the car and let's do the scene. And so you have to be willing to stand up for yourself. And it was great because the truth is, he didn't even know that he was being offensive. It wasn't intentional. Sometimes people just need to have their eyes opened a little bit. And we can do it in a nice way. Or, you know, if that's not getting through, then we'll take other steps. But um, so that's my opening, whatever. Okay. <laughs> I spent four years at another university in the southeast, which will sh remain unnamed, which was one of the worst experiences I've had in my life. Now, be beware, I'm, I'm a Title VII lawyer and professor. I know this stuff. And a number of us were complaining because the men were, you know, the those professors, we get to pick who we want to hire. So they only, only wanted to hire their buddies or other men, and they definitely did not want to hire people of color, especially women of color. So we were protesting that, and then we, because we were protesting, and uh, if we were women who kind of would stick with them and not speak out, it was okay. But we were also protesting the fact that a number of them were having affairs with their students and were using grades in order to do that, you know, that kind of thing. But in any event, I don't want to spend a long time on it, but, but we protested so much that they started calling us the affirmative action hires. That was, that was our title. Now, we were all untenured at the time. Very difficult situation. Yeah. And I led a group that went to the press, and there were seven of us who left the institution, and we all landed on our feet. So that's the good news. Yeah. The bad news is it was the most painful thing I can, I can yeah. ever tell you about. I will at one point when we get a chance, want to talk a little bit about the limitations of Title VII because there are some problems in this context and I'll do that when you're ready for that. Okay. Well, one of the biggest challenges that I've had to face is uh, living with huge ambitions which haven't always materialized. And, and part of this is because of my own neuroses or my financial instability. Uh, but I do think that I, I'm sure that sexual harassment and discrimination are part of why I'm still a relative nobody. And I made a list of some of the people who played uh, roles in that montage. It's, it's, a, it's a, a kind of a response thing. And the, the chorus is, me too, me too. So here goes. Uh, the filmmaker who uh, threatened to throw me out of an open window of a skyscraper if I didn't rub his one ball, and it was his 
way of auditioning me, I guess, but I'd always wanted to be behind the camera, not in front of it. The director who cracked lewd jokes about Asian women while I edited his TV commercial, who wanted me to laugh along with his buddies, or at least smile. The director of photography, whose cinematography had so inspired me and I thought would be my mentor until he wanted me to lie down and give him a massage and the director of photography who asked if I'd go skinny dipping with him after we filmed the ocean. Wasn't it enough keeping the waves in focus? And <laughs> the producer who got angry when I stood up in front of the theater and left him holding a bouquet of flowers. The producer who assumed I'd work for free. Me too, me too. The producer who wanted to watch dailies with me on his king-sized bed. The producer who stole my directing credit on my holographic film. Mm -hmm. I got it back. The yeah. producer who took her clothes off before entering the room where I was sleeping on the pretext of looking for something in her dresser drawer. The producer who beat on the flimsy door, uh, motel door in the middle of the night, telling me to open up. The producer reached over his big desk to tweak my Panama hat, maybe in innocent fun, but by then I was too paranoid to pitch. Too bad, because I needed a producer, and I still do. The director and DP who wanted me to procure women for them after a long day of shooting, but the joke was on them because the women that I chose were strong feminists who saw right through them. The producer who stalked me from film festival to festival. I woke up in a rural location once. He'd found out where I was filming and had parked his car a 10 feet away from the trailer where I slept. I asked my friends to call the police and they didn't, they thought he was my friend. The film critic who asked me to drive him home as part of my job as his teaching assistant where I was trying to hide out in academia, my hands shook on the steering wheel. The man who ripped my shirt open under the animation stand while promising to do my special effects. The lab owner who offered to throw in an air conditioner for free along with my dailies if I'd meet him in the projection booth because he thought I was hot, and the jobs I could have had, and the jobs that didn't last. Wow. 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 Thank you, Alexis. I think one of the hallmarks of some of these stories is that there are just so many of them. Like, this is so pervasive in the industry. This might be a good moment um, to go to Anne McGinley um, with really a question about some of the legal aspects. Sometimes sexual harassment, I mean, it can be very obvious, but it can also be subtle. Uh, what resources are available to women to help them recognize inappropriate behavior as harassment or discrimination and take appropriate action? I think we've heard that the reactions to some of these women, as they've reported, have been, you know, they've been called bitches, they've been just told to get out. Um, what steps do you recommend for women who face harassment in the industry? So uh, this is a big question, you know, a huge, I could spend hours on this, but I'll... I'll Give us all the answers. Yes, right okay. Now. There are no answers. That's one of the problems. And one of the problems is it's even harder. Um, the law does prohibit sexual harassment and sex discrimination, and it has pro prohibited sex discrimination since 1964 and sexual harassment since 1986. But the problem is... Um, in order to be covered under Title VII law, you have to be an employee. Now, I'm not sure if a lot of everybody working in the film industry fits within that definition. I think many people don't, mm -hmm. okay? So then the question is, what are you gonna do at that point? You don't have the Title VII protection. Um, well, there are a number of things. Um, one of the things you can do to find out what your rights are anyway are, is to look up certain resources online. If you are covered, you can find out if you're covered by looking at the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission's website. That's EEOC. That's the federal commission that's in charge of Title VII. They have an amazing, um, well, many documents, but they have a task force that was um, 
in 2016 on policies against her sexual harassment, and I think it's the best document I've seen anywhere on it, where they come up with what best practices should be. So if you're in the situation where you actually get to decide that or to influence your employer if you have one, that, that is a really good document. Um, there are other places you can go. Um, I looked, I found last night, it's, I, I guess it's Sheryl Sandberg's, I don't know, it's called leanin.org, but it looks like it has some really good information for people who don't know that much about discrimination. There's also a feminist.org um, slash 9-11 slash harass period, sorry about these. National Women's Law Center, there's the American Bar Association has one, and I want to um, I want to highlight one that a, a number of friends of mine and I um, have gotten together, and we're about to put out a website called Unleash Equality, which um, includes discussions of how the law how the law affects sexual harassment, et cetera. Now we've got the Nevada Equal Rights Commission. If you're here, and one of the things that if you're not somebody who's covered, who's surely not covered, if you're not even arguably um, an employee, if you are, the Nevada law actually has an extra provision, which is the public accommodations provision that you could possibly sue under. I haven't really seen that work yet, but I think it possibly could, which basically says it's discrimination to harass someone if they're in a public accommodation and public, all the kinds of places where we work are also considered to be, many of them are public accommodations. That's another way of getting around the employer employee relationship. Um, what do you do when somebody harasses you? <laughs> well, if, you're in, if you happen to be an employee and you happen to be in a place where they actually have good policies, you might want to go report it. But let's take a look at those policies. They should have very strong anti-harassment provisions. They should have non-retaliation provisions. And if they don't, I wouldn't want to report it. Mm -hmm. If you're going, before you report it, you really probably should talk to the harasser if you can. If not, obviously you're not expected to. If there are witnesses, you get those people lined up for you. Write down everything that has gone on. If this happens more than once or even if it only happens once, keep a record. Um, I would um, talk to others to see if that particular individual or group of individuals has harassed them. I, I think there's safety in numbers. Mm -hmm. People get fired all the time for reporting, even though the law says you can't get fired for reporting. They do it anyway. So it's a really tricky thing to figure out how to use your rights even when you have them, because if you're using them often, um, you're going to get retaliated against. So you have to think about that. And that's why a lot of women haven't. That's why the Me Too is so powerful, right. because it's not just the law. It is society coming yeah. together and yeah. saying, we're not going to put up with this. Yeah. If you can get groups of men to agree with you that this is terrible stuff that's going on, I hate to say rely on those guys, but that does work, right? Um, and if you're in a leadership position, you want to try to get these good policies written, um, the ones that the EEOC recommends. And you also, if you're in a leadership position, the places where sexual harassment and discrimination take place most is where there's segregated jobs. So when the leadership is male and other job categories are female, that's where it happens. So you need to integrate your top jobs and have lots of women at the top, and that will make a big difference.